Hey, everybody. Let's see. You all having a good PAX out there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, hold on. Let's do that again. I need a little. I flew in from Tokyo a couple days ago. I'm still catching up on my sleep, so let's try this one more time. Everybody having a good PAX? Yeah. Thanks. I needed that. Hi, I'm Jeff. And Hi, I'm Colby. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks to Wizards of the Coast for creating an awesome game that we love, that hopefully a lot of you love, and if you don't, hopefully you will soon love uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And just want to say these are entirely our own opinions. I'm a game designer. I didn't work on D&D. This is just me kind of looking at somebody else's work. And um, we, we don't work for Wizards yeah. of the Coast. Um, we weren't part of the team that created yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. Just wanted to get that little yeah. disclaimer out there. And um, hey, also thanks to my friends over at Codename Entertainment for letting us use some of their art assets along the way. And just wanted to say, hey, I'm Jeff. I've been a professional game designer since 97. I was uh, one of the, I was a MUD programmer and a modder, was in one of the original designers of EverQuest a very long time ago, the guy six or seven on the team. I worked on a lot of games since then. In 06, I moved to a research company called EDAR, founded it with a friend, did uh, video game research for a decade and then founded a VR studio in 16, did a couple of games, including a D&D game and an officially licensed Settlers of Catan game. And now I'm the studio director of Extra Credits and oversee literally hundreds of videos that go out every year with uh, some of the team who's somewhere in the audience. Scattered. Oh. Hey, guys. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, but mostly I'm a systems designer. I'm the kind of game designer who breaks down and constructs, analyzes, and just looks at how things work. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to do this talk. Yeah. And this guy over here. Um, yeah, my name's Colby. My background is a little less um, impressive, I think, and focused, right. at least for a PAX audience. Mm -hmm. um, I got a master's degree in literature and then taught for the English department at the University of Utah for a few years and then spent 17 years in the corporate world as like an executive at a payments processing company. Um, helped take it from a startup to a global corporation, but two of my great passions in life have always been stories and gaming. Um, and nowhere, in my opinion, do these two things come together better than in tabletop role-playing games, right? TTRPGs. Um, naturally then, I've been playing D&D since I was 12 years old. Um, a year and a half ago, I took that passion that I have for this game and created a little COVID side project, um, I started a YouTube channel, like everyone else during the pandemic, right? Um, and uh, I, I call it D4, D&D Deep Dive. Um, it's mostly focused on creating like fun, powerful characters for Dungeons and Dragons, but I also have videos that focus on discussing the rules of the game, D&D news, giving advice to people who play, um, and teaching people like the basics of the game uh, to help them get started. So 20 months or so in, and the channel's coming up on 50,000 subscribers and growing. Yeah. Um, almost 5 million views, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> talk goals. Mm -hmm. So obviously, we can't cover the entirety of D&D mm -hmm. in an hour. But we can provide a lot of commentary on the design choices and talk about kind of the four big roles of D&D and central core D&D mechanics. And, and honestly, like coming from a game developer perspective, I mm -hmm. think that Jeff has, it's been really interesting to me mm -hmm. to just kind of almost think about D&D from a, a, like a game dev perspective, mm -hmm. which I frankly haven't really done before. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that will be interesting, but we can also keep you entertained mm -hmm. along the way. Cool, so let's get to it. And we'll start with the big thing, you know, hey, Colby, what's D&D? &D? <laughs> so Wizards of the Coast, the creators of D&D, &D, have a really great description. Since it's their game, I'll start with an abbreviated version of it. The Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game is about storytelling in worlds of swords and sorcery. Oh, I left one bad, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, it shares the elements uh, with childhood games of make-believe. Like those games, D&D &D is driven by imagination. Unlike a game of make-believe, D&D give, gives structure to the stories, mm -hmm. a way of determining the consequences of the adventure's actions. Uh, players roll dice to resolve whether their attacks mm -hmm. hit or miss, or whether their adventures can scale a cliff or pull off some other dangerous task. Anything is possible, but the dice make some outcomes mm -hmm. more probable than others. 
And so you say, you know, why is this interesting? And Dungeons and Dragons actually had its origins in tactical miniature wargaming, and it was first released in the 70s. And not counting the softbound books, has had five and a half editions. So Dungeons and Dragons is the most popular role-playing game in the world. Um, and fifth edition, the current version, released in 2014, uh, also commonly known as 5E, is the best-selling edition of D&D ever. Mm -hmm. um, what do you need to play? Mm -hmm. A player's handbook, mm -hmm. uh, which are like the core rules. You need a set of dice, mm -hmm. which many of us who play have mm -hmm. way too many of those. Mm -hmm. um, a character, mm -hmm. writing utensils, that there can never be too many, right? Mm -hmm. That was a misnomer, sorry. Uh, writing utensils, a group of people, preferably ones mm -hmm. you like, uh, though that's not strictly necessary, I mm -hmm. suppose. And um, yeah, and the interesting thing is for players, all you need is the player's handbook, which is great. And if you don't own it, hey, it's a great thing to go buy and support the game's creators. And I think I'm gonna see one more blue thing here, which is I should have added more of the recent books, saying there's also a lot of supplemental material, which has races, classes, monsters, and more. So the dungeon master, uh, or DM, sometimes referred to as the GM, or game master, is the game's lead storyteller and like referee. They run the game for the players. The players are participants and contributors to the game. Each player has a character, their in-game alter ego. I, I like to describe D&D, &D, when I'm talking to people who don't know a lot about it, mm -hmm. as both a game and a story, right? Really, it's a group of friends who use the mechanics of a game to tell a story that they create together. Mm -hmm. So, how do you play? Well, pulling back at a really, really high level view for D&D, mechanically the flow breaks into three discrete steps, um, which is description. Right, so description, the DM describes the situation. And then action, one or more players take a character action, and this may be a multi-part process if there's dice rolling involved. And then results, the DM describes the results. Sometimes, this is storytelling, other times, dice are used to determine how successful a character's actions are. And from a classification perspective, there's really three main categories of gameplay. And I say this because we'll get into it, D&D is split up in a way that most other games you play aren't. So for example, part number one is exploration, and that's movement through the world. This is everything from like sneaking through the back alleys of Waterdeep, to traversing a mountain pass, to moving through the quarters of a vampire's tomb. Right. Using our like description, action, results paradigm, mm -hmm. uh, an example of this might be, mm -hmm. you know, me as the DM, right, mm -hmm. says something like, after a few hours of searching, mm -hmm. you find the glade you were looking for, mentioned by the mm -hmm. hermit. In the center of the glade is a moss-covered statue worn by age. Mm -hmm. As you approach, the forest goes strangely silent. And as the player, like, hmm, okay, I'm gonna hold up my hand, stop the party to listen. Okay. Roll a die to see how good your perception is at the moment. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you really have a die? That would be awesome. Of course he does. 17. Did you really? Yeah. You really got a 17. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, in that case, mm -hmm. you know, for a moment, uh, mm -hmm. it seems really quiet, but then ahead and like off to the right, mm -hmm. you hear the faint shifting of foliage, like there's maybe a hidden creature mm -hmm. nearby that's approaching stealthily. Mm -hmm. So that was description, action, and result. And for combat, you know, that's an attempt to defeat your opponents, you know, whether it's killing, taking captives, forcing a rout. And D&D is amazing that in its combat, everything from lowly kobolds and goblins to mighty giants and demons and dragons. And so again, kind of from a description point of view, it's like, you know, as the DM, hey, the wizard's bolt of fire scorches the ogre. Hey, Ranger, you're up. All right, I knock an arrow and I fire at the ogre and I thank you. Rolled. Ugh. A five to hit. <laughs> plus, wait, 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 plus, uh, plus my bonuses, so that's actually a 13. Which like, hits the ogre, so, oh, I don't have a six, uh, D8. A, a D8 to roll damage, okay, so I roll a different die for damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got a six, six so points of damage. The ogre grunts in pain and continues lumbering towards you. Okay, so finally, mm -hmm. we have social interaction, uh, which is a cornerstone of d and It might mean intimidating like a captured scout mm -hmm. into revealing information or haggling in the marketplace over the price of strawberries or more commonly, I suppose, magic items mm -hmm. that you wanna purchase. Um, it isn't always the DM using this like description action results paradigm. Often players will interact with each other mm -hmm. uh, using the same pattern. And so the question is kind of like why? You know, why do we do it this way? And one of the answers is it works. That you know, D&D &D is a modification of group storytelling. 
This existed for thousands of years. And it's also a format that we used in early computer games, especially the text adventure games. You'd read a description, input your action, and see the result. And unlike text games, which can only accept you know, what's programmed into it, one of the really cool things about D&D &D and live play is that you know, it's improv. It's the DM listening, improving off of that, and the player's going. And it makes for a really more interesting and engaging game that's really hard to replicate on a computer game. And I can say that having made lots of them. <laughs> exactly. Um, in fact, I often describe playing D&D &D very much <clears throat> excuse me, like uh, improv comedy, right? For those who are familiar with improv mm -hmm. comedy, it's, it's, it's usually described as a series of yes and moments. One person mm -hmm. does or says something, and instead of saying, no, that didn't happen, you're supposed to take what they give you and basically run with it, right, and mm -hmm. add to it. D&D &D is like improv comedy plus improv drama plus improv action almost, like mm -hmm. all rolled into one, right? Where you're all sort mm -hmm. of playing off each other and adding to what the next person does and, and running with it to tell the story. Yeah. Um, now, D&D &D adventures have different levels of combat, exploration, and social interaction, hopefully adjusted to the tastes of the players involved. Mm -hmm. There is no, let me emphasize this, as someone who likes to create <laughs> optimized characters for Dungeons and Dragons, there is no right way to play D&D, &D, right? This is a game, and it should be played so that you and your group has fun. Absolutely. Period. So for D&D, &D, the core loop probably looks familiar. And this is actually was the basis for most RPGs, and to be fair, most games with a leveling system, which is adventure, reward, and level up. Yeah, from the earliest editions, adventuring gave rewards of experience and treasure. Enough experience and the character leveled up, increasing their power. Um, more powerful characters need more challenging adventures, of course, so the danger levels of encounters increase, right? This is the core loop. Mm -hmm. And in older editions, experience was only rewarded actually for killing things and then even earlier for finding gold. Mm -hmm. In more recent editions, experience is awarded for defeating opponents as opposed to killing and for resolving encounters. And the cool thing about this is it allows for a much more problem-solving approach to D&D, where if the only thing, you know, the, and really it makes adventurers less sociopathic, because if the only way to get a reward is to kill things, everybody goes off and kills things. But if you can get reward by solving something, there's a lot more options. And anybody else play at a table filled with just murder hobos? Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, since we're talking about games and rules, Dungeons and Dragons is not a game that is won or lost, mm -hmm. right? This is a collaboration where together the DM and players create stories mm -hmm. of adventure. Mm -hmm. And D&D encompasses what's called both structured and unstructured orders of play. Like many board games, mm -hmm. D &D, uh, the combat in D&D is resolved with a structured order of play. This means that each player has a turn on the player's turn, their character gets to do stuff, right? Once every player has had a turn, we say that a round of combat has passed. Combat begins with the players rolling dice to see who acts first. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, mm -hmm. Initiative. And then comes the question, well, why do we do this? Well, initiative is used to randomize the order of actions, and one of the cool things it does is it makes every combat different. It means that players have to adapt their strategy on who goes when, both with allies and with opponents. And turn order kind of ensures a level of fairness in combat because on a player's turn, there's a finite amount of stuff that their character can do. And structured turns specify when your characters can do a thing, but it also means when they can't do a thing. And this helps, let's call, say, keep active players from doing more than they should and ensures that low key players get to actually do stuff. Yeah. So this is actually kind of a prompt built into the game system to help make the, say, less vocal among us get into the action more. And, and keep the spotlight hogs, mm -hmm. you know, tempered down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, finally, turn structure helps form narrative, right? Limiting character actions gives consequences to missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. The party might have only a few seconds to stop a villain before they teleport away or to stabilize an unconscious character before mm -hmm. they die. And exploration is, and social actions are resolved what's called unstructured order of play, where the spotlight follows one or more characters rather than going around the table asking what everybody's actions are. Right. So these situations allow players to contribute or not as mm. they feel is appropriate for their character. For example. Yeah. Hey, Colby, um, I think uh, my <laughs> character's heading off to the alchemist shop. Um, they're going to go find out what the purple substance is. Um, my name's Saradon. No. Oh. I don't know why you're calling me Colby. Saradon Fallowshield, mm -hmm. actually. <clears throat> um, right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll join him. Mm -hmm. I'll go with him. Or... Um, 
okay, my character appears. I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna sneak down the tomb's passageway. I'm gonna check for traps along the way. Yeah, we're not very sneaky. We'll just hang back here and mm -hmm. we'll let the rogue do his thing. Mm -hmm. So why do we do this? So unstructured order of play speeds up the game. Um, when you're told it's your character's turn, we're prompting you as game designers to take an action. By removing turn order and therefore the prompts, players have an opportunity to join in without the compulsion that comes with it's your turn. And this allows narrative elements to happen over time without removing player agency. For new players, an important concept is that if you're not in combat, you can join in at any point. There's no turn order, right? Mm -hmm. Unlike combat, which represents six second rounds, non-combat time is expressed in minutes, hours, and days, or sometimes even weeks, mm -hmm. months, and years. Mm -hmm. So fifth edition was designed to be a mass market game much more than every other edition, and it reflects in the fact that it is the best-selling game WotC has ever put out for D&D. Every edition I've heard I can't confirm this, that fifth edition has sold more than every other edition put together. Wow. And that it regularly tops the Amazon charts when they put out new books. And so designed to be a more mass market game, it's upped its level of representation and inclusivity as can be seen in art and tone. But along with that, it's sacrificed certain levels of complexity that allow for greater rule consistency, for faster playing, for more flexibility. And this design can, intent can be seen with a lot of philosophies. And once we call them out, kind of watch for them when you're playing D&D &D because they just show up everywhere. Right. So standardization of systems, right? Design goal number one, fifth edition D&D &D uses the same or similar systems whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And the reuse of the mechanics allows players to more easily learn how the game operates. You know, why create three unique systems when instead you can make one system that handles three situations? So elegance is prioritized. Where possible, systems are simplified and reduced in mechanical complexity. Simple here doesn't have a negative connotation. Uh, experienced designers will tell you that simple is often harder to do, or at least effectively, right? Yeah, and the elegance of design kind of pays off in the increased rules comprehension. It's faster to play when you have to spend less time looking things up. Right. In fifth edition, exceptions to standardized rules are rare. A conscious effort was made to say, do we really need mm. something different for this? And there's still plenty of exceptions in fifth ed, but they're less common. And because of that, they're easier to remember and they're a lot cooler when they happen. Right. You know, if you're the only class that gets a thing, that's a lot cooler than if it's kind of spread more generally around. Right. Um, bonuses only, this is really cool. So 5e almost never uses penalties. And I've discovered this as I've <laughs> tried to create characters that, that inflict a lot of penalties, right? It, it prefers to give bonuses. Um, you almost always add to a number, very rarely do you subtract. For example, in older editions mm -hmm. of D&D, there were penalties for using weapons that you weren't proficient with. Uh, in fifth edition, there are no non-proficiency penalties. Instead, there are bonuses added to weapons you are proficient mm -hmm. with, but anybody could use that weapon. Mm -hmm. If you're not proficient, you just don't get to add your bonus, mm -hmm. right? And this is actually what's called a behavioral economics approach, where even if the math provides the same probability, it's a system designed to make people feel good. People like adding things. People really feel bad when they're taking things away, especially on their own thing. So even though the stats are the same, it's designed in a way to make the players feel better during the actual presentation of it. And actually, here's our first design rule, that um, unlike previous editions, where sometimes you wanted a lower or even negative number, say for like your armor class, your weapon speed, in fifth edition, they've aligned everything where higher numbers are always better. Higher hit points, harder to kill. Higher armor class, harder to hit. Right. So let's talk about dice. You'll see the, the notation D20, D10, mm -hmm. D6, etc. a mm -hmm. lot. This means roll a die of the appropriate type, right? Mm -hmm. Roll a D20 means roll a 20-sided die like we were just doing. Mm -hmm. um, a number before the D, like 2D6, means to roll that number of dice. So 2D6 indicates the rolling mm -hmm. of two six-sided dice, mm -hmm. right? Speaking of rolls, um, hey, why do we have dice? Oh, because we love them. <laughs> um, there, there are actions that the players and the DM resolve without rolling mm -hmm. dice. Uh, these are mm -hmm. part of the game and the storytelling process, like we've said. These mm -hmm. actions are usually things that would be easy to accomplish. I walk over there, right? I say hi to the innkeeper. Mm -hmm. the, 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 those things don't, don't have a chance of failure, or mm -hmm. at least the, the chance is so infinitesimally small that there's no die mm -hmm. roll needed. There are other times mm -hmm. when you need to know if an action succeeds. Mm -hmm. 
how well an action succeeds, or even if it fails spectacularly, which can also be awesome. Uh, indeed. It's like, you know, as a player, like, hey, you know, I sit down at, I sit down at the knight's table and I slide a pint across the table to them. Great. No dice roll needed. Um, his eyes narrow. No, okay. I use the sliding drink as a distraction to pull the da my dagger, keeping it under the table. Ah, time for a dice roll. Mm -hmm. How stealthily the dagger is pulled is going to influence what happens next. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, is the GM, okay. Wait, what was your character's name? Uh, Ceridon. Ceridon, you shuffle along the edge, mindful of the hundred foot drop below you. No dice roll needed for that. And ahead of you, there's a ledge that's crumbled away, and there's about a five foot gap. Uh, all right, I'm gonna jump across. Okay, and this is time for a die roll, because the dice roll determines the character's uh, success, and with a hundred foot drop, there's really consequences to the failure for that action. Right. Um, it's okay, I have the feather fall spell if no. I fail. Um, unless you're rolling damage, you almost always mm. roll a d20. Mm. And a d20, you know, as per its name, hey, 20 sides. And this provides a really good range of possibility with the advantage of only having a single die roll. Multiple dice rolls slow things down because math, drinks, cats, table edges, <laughs> that there's a lot of opportunities. The more dice you roll, the more interesting things can happen. Right. D20s also allow ones and 20s mm -hmm. on the die, right? The lowest and highest rolls to show up infrequently enough to safely attach additional results mm -hmm. to their consequences, or mm -hmm. to their occurrence, sorry. More on this uh, later. Mm -hmm. But also, perhaps most importantly, mm -hmm. the reason we have dice is because rolling dice is fun. Absolutely. And in 50, rolling dice, um, again, with kind of the philosophy, high numbers are always better than low numbers. There are no roll under this number systems. It is always roll this number or higher, which is, again, it's a change from previous editions. Because there are sometimes beneficial effects for rolling a 20 on a 20-sided die, rolls of 20 are called natural 20s. And rolls that result in a 20, like a roll plus a bonus, is sometimes called a dirty 20, just to make it clear you didn't roll a natural 20 along the way. Right. Different editions have had different rules on rolling natural 20s, uh, being automatic successes and natural ones being automatic failures. Mm -hmm. And in fifth edition, 20s and ones are only auto successes and failures on attack rolls and death saves, but not on ability checks, skill checks, and saving throws, which we will get to. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about the five or four big dice rolls in D&D. Okay. Uh, &D. So, in earlier editions, different types of actions mm -hmm. used unique tables to determine mm -hmm. likelihood of success. It was a ton of fun going back and copying all these out <laughs> of previous books. But kind of in line with our philosophy of standardization of systems, all of those tables and many more have been consolidated and replaced. There's now only four types of dice rolls that account for roughly 95% of the rules, rolling rules in D&D. And they're used to determine the success and failure of character actions. Right and all use the same base formula. They are ability checks. Your character attempts an action like holding their breath while underwater or forcing open a door mm -hmm. that relies on like physical and mental abilities rather than training necessarily. Things like your strength, your wisdom, your charisma, your intelligence, mm -hmm. etc. And then you get a skill check, which is your character attempting to you know, say like sneak past a guard, jump over a pit, remember the meaning or arcane symbols. Something they use both their ability for, but also their training. You can get better at a thing. Then you have saving throws. So your character attempts to shrug off a charm spell or resist a snake's venom. Saving throws are for avoiding or resisting harm, hmm. generally. And finally, your attack roll is like your character swinging his sword, punching, hurling a magical bolt of fire. They're attempting to hit a thing. Almost all D&D actions fall into one of these four categories and therefore use one of hmm. these four rolls. And so, you know, how does this work? Well, at its basics, you roll a d20, you add a bonus or two. No more charts and tables, slimmed down and sped up for mass market play. Physical and mental ability is reflected by adding a character's ability score modifier. If you have a high strength, add your strength bonus to dice rolls involving physical power. And skill and training are re reflected by what's called a proficiency bonus. So if you spend time, say, studying history, you get to add your proficiency bonus to all rolls involving history. But it really is roll, ability, proficiency, for everything. Yeah. Your character, now ability scores, your character's natural, physical, and mental mm. uh, attributes are their ability scores. D&D &D has six primary ability scores. They are the foundation of most D&D &D systems and are referenced by almost every single mm. dice roll. And this is because a character should be good at a lot of stuff. After all, they're the heroes of the story, but also they shouldn't be good at everything. That's a little bit boring unless you're making a skill monkey. 
<laughs> but, and by having numbers associated with the scores, we can quantify a character's natural ability and use that to adjust what happens in the game. So this means that if you envision your character being dexterous, you need to assign them a high dexterity score, mm -hmm. right? And in first edition, ability score tables looked something like this. There were ability scores for characters that range from three to 18 with individual tables for each score and each one had different bonuses. Your strength had radically different bonuses than your dexterity, even at the exact same number. Right. In 5e, ability scores range from three to 20 with a unified single table showing ability score modifiers. For example, a 12 strength gives a plus one bonus mm -hmm. on strength rolls. So okay, roll number one, ability checks. This is your character attempting an action that requires pure natural ability, untrained. So you roll a d20, roll your ability score modifier. So this is like forcing open a door, roll a d20 and add your strength modifier, or holding a breath while underwater, roll a d20 and mm -hmm. add your constitution modifier, right? And they're all noted on your character sheet, so they're the big numbers in those boxes right there. So proficiency, proficiency reflects a character's practice and training. Proficiencies have been around mm. in different forms since first edition, but have been streamlined for modern 5e play. Mm. And with our bonuses only philosophy, being proficient add, just adds a bonus to your roles. And again, not being proficient doesn't keep you from performing an action, it just means you don't get a bonus. And you can be proficient with everything from weapons to armor, tools, even saving throws now. They, again, they just unified the system. Right. Proficiency bonus starts at plus two. If you are proficient, add plus two to the dice roll. Proficiency bonus increases as your character levels mm -hmm. up. So why is that? Well, kind of like ability scores, knowing what your character is good at is necessary for the mechanics of the game, as well as quantifying what does good at mean. And so this quantifies what your practice and training brings to a situation. Skills are a common type of proficiency. There are 19 skills in the D&D 5e system. Most characters are proficient in mm. four to six of them unless you make a skill monkey mm. like you were talking about. And each skill is associated with one ability score. Stealth, for example, is dexterity, or history is an intelligence skill. And roll number two, skill checks. So for skill checks, you roll a d20 and you add the appropriate ability score modifier. If you're proficient with the relevant mm -hmm. skill, add your proficiency bonus as well. And again, you can roll for anything. You don't have to be proficient for it. Proficient just means you're better. Right. And so for exi example, this might be, no, oh, I'm on the right side. Sneaking past a guard, roll a d20, add your dex and your stealth skill, haggling with a merchant, charisma, and your persuasion skill. Right. Each skill's total bonus is listed on your character sheet. Making a skill check, roll a d20, and add this number. Mm -hmm. Roll number three are saving throws, or saves, which is attempts to resist things, spells, traps, poisons, and other threats. The interesting thing is saves are never initiated by a player. They're always a response that something that's happening to them. Right. Older editions used per class saving throw tables, mm -hmm. where 5e has replaced all of these with a single system. Saving throws are now mechanically identical to skill checks down to having different characters proficient at different types of saving throws. And examples of saves again, resisting a charm or struggling off poison. And a successful save means that you avoid or mitigate the effect. Uh, a failed save means that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love that graphic. Pretty, pretty straightforward. <laughs> and probably get burned to ash by a ball mm -hmm. of fire or whatever it was they were trying to resist. Mm -hmm. Um, your bonus saves uh, are noted on your character sheet. Roll a d20 and add mm -hmm. this number. And roll number four, attack rolls are attempts to hit a target. Swinging a sword, shooting a bow, throwing a rock, mm -hmm. or even hurling a magical bolt of fire are mm -hmm. all attacks. And attack rolls have really changed over the additions, going from table to mathematical formulas like FACO, to now it's just a single formula, very much like the others. Um, ability check, skill check, saving throw. The only addition is you might have a magic weapon which adds something to the end. So where attack rolls branch out is deciding which mm. of the six ability scores to use. Mm. Weapons, with very few exceptions, are used, you use either your strength or your dexterity mm. to hit. Mm -hmm. And um, dampiers, Damp damp dampiers use constitution. Wait, hold on, <laughs> really? Yeah. I made the slide and now, <laughs> I had to go make a new slide because they, <laughs> they do. there's now one, one race one, that gets a constitution that's attack. Right. But anyway, okay, so Nampers use con. But based on your class, um, you know, spellcasters then use intelligence, wisdom, or charisma for spells. So for example, a sorcerer is a charisma caster. She uses her charisma when she casts a spell. This makes, 
<laughs> this makes hybrid caster mm -hmm. classes like rangers and paladins need greater diversity in their ability scores. Mm -hmm. The wizard's primary focus is their intelligence where a ranger might want dexterity for their bow attacks but wisdom for their spells. And returning to weapons, melee weapons like swords and thrown weapons, spears use strength where ranged weapons like bows and crossbows use dexterity. Right. There is also a class of melee weapons called finesse weapons. Uh, rapiers, scimitars, daggers mm -hmm. that let you use your dexterity instead of your strength. And this is really a cute bit of design. By associating weapons with ability scores and spells with ability scores, we nudge players to kind of take a thematically appropriate armaments and abilities. Dexterous characters like rogues use rapiers. Strong characters like fighters use swords and axes. Right. And again, you could use anything. This just is kind of designed or helping reinforce theme to make it come out as people play the game. So. Examples of attack rolls, uh, swinging a long sword, hurling a bolt of fire mm. if you're a wizard, and then bonuses to hit and damage are recorded on your character sheet. And these four rolls mechanically cover pretty much all major actions taken in D&D, which is kind of cool that um, you know it comes down to this compared to every chart and table that used to be in the previous editions that the designers could figure out how to simplify it down but still make it feel really, really good. Yeah. Okay, so... Rule four, mm -hmm. um, success is binary. Dice rolls determine if you succeed or you fail. Succeeding by a lot or failing by just a little bit, doesn't mm -hmm. matter, right? Though many DMs do use degree of success or failure to describe the results mm -hmm. of the action. And then the question is, well, how do you know if you succeed? And there's two target number, uh, two ways, target numbers and contested rolls. So a target number made against a fixed number. You basically have to equal or beat this number and if so, you succeed, and otherwise you don't, you fail. Uh, for some ability checks and skill rolls, you roll against an action's difficulty check, mm -hmm. or DC. The mm -hmm. difficulty check is a description of how hard the action is mm -hmm. to accomplish. And, wait, difficulty check? That, isn't that what it's called? DC? DC, difficulty check. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. Mm -hmm. By show of hands, mm -hmm. for those who are familiar with D&D, &D, mm -hmm. Who, who calls DC difficulty check? And who, but just by show of hands really quick. Mm -hmm. and, and who calls it difficulty class? Oh, okay. I think difficulty class wins. Mm -hmm. There was a somatic argument over it. Well, the arguments is too strong a word, but. <laughs> it wasn't even an argument. It was me, it, okay, this is how it went. He's like, difficulty class, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, um, actually it's called difficulty check. <laughs> and, and, and Jeff's like, um, I, pretty sure in the Dungeon Master Guide it says difficulty class. And mm -hmm. I'm like, that's nonsense. I looked it up, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't know why, I've mm -hmm. called it difficulty check all of my life and I've never been corrected mm -hmm. until now. So it's Com difficulty class. Mm -hmm. Common vernacular. Yeah. But it's really funny because little things like that just creep in and it's just kind of how it goes. But for example, this you know might be opening a jam door. You know, that's a, what slide am I on? Oh, well. <laughs> Here, we're going to go back to the slide to match. There we go. Uh, open a door might be an easy strength check, roll a 10. That means, you know, a character with no strength bonus, a 10, would succeed 55% of the time. Where a barbarian with an 18 strength, a plus 4 bonus, would succeed 75% of the time. Convincing a town guard that you weren't involved in the bar fight, despite the black eye and smell of ale on your breath, sounds difficult. So your target number that you have to roll is a 20. Our barbarian with a charisma of 10, no bonus, would succeed 5% of the time. Our charming bard mm -hmm. with a plus four charisma bonus and a plus three deception skill would succeed 40% of the time. Still tough, but not nearly mm -hmm. the same long odds that the barbarian mm -hmm. would face, right? So another type of role is called a contested role. And this is basically a contest between individuals. For example, sneaking past a guard would be a contested role. Your strength versus their perception. Right. Both participants roll and add their modifiers. The highest roll succeeds. In this case, a higher roll for Zoe means that she successfully sneaks past the guard. A lower roll means that she's noticed. And other examples might include our carousing bard's deception versus the guard's insight. The contested roles could also be an arm wrestling contest, an obscure hibia, which would be strength, obscure trivia, which would be history. But they kind of make it fun. It's the players or you know, people heading off against each other versus kind of more static difficulty. Right. So saving throws and attack rolls also roll against difficulty check to see if they, uh, difficulty class, sorry, 
to see if they succeed or fail. Um, spells, traps, poisons, and the like all have a DC that indicates how potent mm -hmm. they are. And attack rolls have to equal or beat the target's armor class or AC, and we'll talk more about AC shortly. So to recap, mm -hmm. your character's D20 roll plus modifiers mm -hmm. must equal or succeed the target number to succeed on an action. Mm -hmm. And if all these systems seem really planned out, they are. They're part of a design philosophy in fifth edition does, that the designers name bounded accuracy. And it might be summed up something like this. Should this guy be able to even have a hope of hitting that dragon? Actually, hold on, wait, I mislabeled this. Let's try this again. <laughs> Should this guy, the henchman, the henchman, have any hope of hitting that big thing? <laughs> In earlier editions of D&D, leveling up added, among other things, bonuses to hit and plentiful magical gear added further bonuses. To maintain the threat level, higher level monsters were made increasingly harder to hit. At a certain point, the math of these mechanics meant that lower leveled monsters, henchmen, and characters needed to roll natural 20s, which automatically hit, to, to do anything, right? The same was true for skills and some types of magic. So basically, as you gained levels, you'd progress from killing lesser monsters to killing more powerful monsters, and the DAM had to really carefully deploy the correct power level of foe, because if it was too no, low mathematically, there was literally no threat. And if it was too high, the party might just get one shot. And this had the unintended consequence of giving the impression that like some video games, the world leveled up with you, kind of a treadmill effect, but you never really felt like you were getting more powerful because everything you bumped into was always had to be perfectly matched to you. And bounded accuracy kind of looked to change that. So in third and fourth editions, you might get two handfuls of modifiers to a single die roll. In 5e, the designers greatly consolidated what gives a bonus, restricting it down to what we just covered, mostly ability scores and proficiencies. The range of these numbers was also reduced. In third edition, a 20th level fighter, which is like max level, right, would add a plus 20 class bonus to hit. In 5th edition, that same 20th level fighter would add a plus 6. And magic items were actually removed from the balance equation. In earlier third editions, they were plentiful and actually almost required. They were built into the math formula. The game was balanced assuming you had the appropriate level of them. In 5th edition, the game's actually balanced with the assumption that you don't have any magic items. So even having a plus 1 weapon is now a really big thing and actually puts you ahead of the mathematical curve of kind of your level versus fighting a monster. Armor class was also greatly reworked. During development, the 5E designers worked out a rough maximum total bonus that characters could have and like divided up how to get it, mostly through ability score and proficiency mm -hmm. bonuses. And this is all greatly simplified. I mean, we could spend an hour literally just talking about bounded accuracy and its effect on the games. But a net effect of all of this is that mathematically, lower level characters can now be useful in fights against higher level foes and lower powered monsters in mass can still threaten higher level characters because the math is much more consolidated and on the D20 die roll, you can actually get something. So in fifth edition, what that really comes down to is this henchman up there might actually contribute to the fight where in earlier editions, they'd be irrelevant. Right. And bounded accuracy's consolidation of bonuses meant that switch situational bonuses also needed to be removed. Which brings us to one of our favorite 5E systems, mm -hmm advantage and disadvantage. Mm -hmm. With its background in wargaming, early editions of D&D had tables of, <laughs> tables of modifiers for different situations, right? Mm -hmm. In combat, you might get a bonus to hit a flanked opponent or for being on higher ground. 5e replaces most of these with the advantage-disadvantage mm -hmm. system. And so basically, if you're in an advantageous situation, you're attacking a prone foe, you're getting assistance bashing down a door, a wingman to help you fast talk an inquisitive innkeeper, you roll with advantage. And what advantage means is just you roll two 20-sided dice instead of one, and you take whichever of the two dice is higher. Disadvantage is the evil twin. Disadva disadvantageous situations might involve fighting on slick ice, trying to sneak in heavy armor, or our bard convincing the guard that, no, it wasn't me in the bar fight. Hint, yes, it was. The bard is always guilty, always. Yeah, you, so you roll two d20s and you keep the lowest die roll. If you end up with both advantage and disadvantage, they cancel each other out and you roll normally. Mm -hmm. And notice that we're not actually adding a bonus to hit. What we're doing is rolling an extra die. 
And that fits within the bounded accuracy philosophy because they didn't want to keep adding dice roll numbers to the roll. Instead, they're giving you an extra opportunity for it. And for me, advantage and disadvantage really capture the elegance philosophy system of 5e. And they also make for really faster play because you're not constantly looking up things in tables again. You're like, oh, cool, I roll with advantage. Two dice, add the number on my character sheet, done, let's move forward and keep having fun. Advantage and disadvantage are also catalysts for player creativity. Many memorable moments of my 5e games have come from players trying to gain advantage in difficult situations, right? Yeah. And this gets us to um, where we can actually talk about combat. Wait, mm -hmm. we need to introduce some more concepts here mm -hmm. if we're going to talk about combat. Let's see, hit points, AC, and it, yeah, OK. <laughs> well. So let's start with hit points. Mm -hmm. Hit points, or HP, represent a combination of physical and mental durability, the will to live and luck. Since higher numbers are better, right, part of the philosophy, mm -hmm. creatures with more hit points are more difficult to kill. And weapons, spells, environmental hazards, things like that, they do hit points of damage. If you reach zero, you fall unconscious. And we'll talk about that in a minute. A character's class determines how many hit points they start with and how many they gain every time they level up. Every class has a hit point, or sorry, a hit die or hit dice. A mm -hmm. D8 is standard at first level. You get maximum hit points. So if you're a standard class, you're going to start with eight hit points. And then you get to add your con bonus. So if you had a plus two bonus from a 14 con, you'd have eight plus two or 10 hit points. And some classes get larger and some classes get smaller hit dice to reflect kind of their role in the game. So a fighter gets a D10 instead of a D8, so they would start with two more hit points than a standard class. Resting. As characters adventure, they get wounded and deplete their spells and abilities. To get these back, they must rest. At the end of a long rest, eight hours, characters need to, or, sorry, characters heal to max hit points and regain all of their spells and all of their abilities. During short rests, which are only about an hour long, characters can spend mm -hmm. hit dice to heal. Think of hit dice as healing charges that come back when you take a long rest, mm -hmm. right? And actually, what's really interesting is these rest mechanics profoundly changed how D&D is played. In previous editions, non-magical healing happened over days or weeks of game time. And because of this, players would actually get mad at clerics often when they cast anything other than a cure spell, because that was basically, yeah, yeah I hear the laugh. Speaking yeah. from experience. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I remember ones where it's like, cool, we cleared out three rooms in the dungeon. Let's go camp for a week to heal up while we do chain cast of heals. Yeah. And because characters now heal quickly between encounters, magical healing in combat's actually become an option to weigh against other spell casting choices rather than a combat and a non-combat, or rather than a combat necessity. And this has really just opened up a whole bunch of avenues of play to expand certain classes from earlier editions. Right. So as for ability use, there are three types of spells and abilities. There are things that you can do at will, things that you can do a number of times per short rest, and things that you can mm -hmm. do a number of times per long rest. And at will means that it's a thing like a cantrip or an ability can be used an unlimited number of times. And short rest spells and abilities have a limited number of times that once expended, you take a short rest. And then long rest abilities are the same but require a long rest. Now classes usually have either all short rest or all long rest abilities. The rogue is interesting in that the base class of the rogue has no class abilities that get expended. Every ability is at will. Assuming your rogue doesn't get hurt, they can keep adventuring indefinitely, and we're not talking about subclass here mm -hmm. stuff, because I know there's some of you out there that are like, <laughs> arcane tricksters, nah, mm -hmm. they have spells, blah, blah, blah. But, Talk about the rogue. And the kind of cool thing about this is by limiting spells and abilities, you're forcing your players to make interesting choices on how to expend their resources. This is, again, a built-in part of the game trying to make it more interesting. You know, do you blow all of your stuff on one fight, making the encounter easier, hoping you can rest right after? Or do you say, have to save some of your things and pace it out, waiting for a more dire situation? This also lets the DM set up different scenarios. A solo fight against just one big bad boss type monster, right, can be more dangerous knowing that characters can use everything they've got. Whereas a dungeon crawl or of like encounter after encounter forces mm -hmm. the party to conserve their resources. Um, before we get to armor and weapons, let's talk about armor class. Armor class or AC represents how well a character avoids being wounded in battle. Sticking with our high numbers are better philosophy. The higher your AC, the harder you are to hit. And this is a departure from earlier editions where AC, lower AC was better. A negative 10 in earlier editions was as good as you could get. 
and involved, actually, for a lot of people, some very interesting mathematics to try and figure out how things worked. And your character's default AC is what armor they wear. If you're proficient, you can add a shield, you can add your dex, but again, a much lower number of things now influence your armor class in line with the bounded accuracy philosophy. So armor's divided into three categories. There's light, medium, and heavy. And each armor grouping has an associated proficiency. Some classes can use all armor, where others might only know how to use or be proficient in light armor or sometimes no armor at all. The heavier the armor, the higher the armor class, which makes you harder to hit, which means that you take less damage. However, unlike earlier editions, there is no single like best armor because of its interaction with dexterity. The heavier the armor, the less dexterity bonus you can use. And that's a couple of interesting things going on here. And again, for fifth edition, in line with the bounded accuracy, this uses a couple of things to limit the top range of AC by adding the armor dex interaction and reduce one common method of having a super high AC. And this is also, again, another case where mechanics help enforce theme, like weapons, where dexterous characters can make really good use of light armor, and stronger characters can actually bear the weight of heavier armor. We also get the fun trade-off between better protection and being able to sneak around effectively. So there are meaningful choices in what to wear, and I think mm -hmm. meaningful choices is what results in interesting and fun gameplay. Right? Yeah. So <clears throat> as far as weapons go, there are two big proficiency grouping of weapons, simple weapons and martial weapons. Martial weapons are just better than simple weapons mm -hmm. because they do more damage. Mm -hmm. um, melee heavy classes like fighters, rangers, barbarians, paladins, all have proficiency mm -hmm. in martial weapons, where melee light classes like mm -hmm. sorcerers and wizards don't. And some classes like rogues have proficiency in simple weapons, but also have proficiency in a small range of martial weapons, in this case, like a short sword or a rapier. And in earlier editions, your characters actually have to pick individually what weapons they were proficient with. And I really just personally vastly prefer the fifth edition where it's kind of big batches of them because it leads to versatility both in armaments and treasure. You know, if your character can use a variety of weapons, your, the DM can hand out more things. In older edition, people only wanted magical longswords. Mm -hmm. They were the best thing. And so all the DM, you know, you'd hand out a magical, you know, War falcon, hammer. warhammer, and people would be like, oh, that's not a longsword, I don't know how to use it. Yeah. So the characters all looked identical. Now, because of cantrips, certain classes don't really use weapons, and that's okay. Unlike their earlier edition counterparts, 5e wizards no longer lug around, generally speaking anyway, darts, white crossbows, etc., because now they can sling bolts of fire or rays of frost at will, which feels a lot more wizardly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's talk about fighting. Cool, so at the beginning of combat, if you kind of remember from earlier, we said that players roll initiative. And initiative is used to determine turn order. And initiative is actually an ability check. So initiative falls into one of our four big roles. It's a d20 plus your dex. And combatants are then arranged in initiative order from highest to lowest, since high numbers are better than low numbers. Starting with the highest initiative, each combatant gets a turn. Put together, this is a round of combat mm. lasting roughly six seconds of game time. Once everyone's had a turn, a new round begins using the same initiative mm. order. And for balance reasons, your character has a limit to the amount of things they can do on their turn. Uh, this breaks down into something called the action economy, which is probably its own entire talk. Yes, but unless stated otherwise, characters get one attack a turn, using the formula we talked about before. A roll of one is always a miss, a roll of 20, a natural 20 is always a hit, and a critical hit, which we'll talk about in a second. So hitting means that you inflict hit points of damage on your target. And damage rolls are one of the few rolls that aren't d20s. Each weapon has an associated die, between a D4 and a D12. And as a rule of thumb, simple weapons do a D6, martial weapons do a D8, and two-handed weapon, martial weapons do a D10 or a D12. And magical spells then list their damage in the spell description. Magical weapons add their bonus to hits and damage rolls mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so like a plus one magical longsword wielded by a 16 strength fighter would do a D8 plus four of damage. A bolt of fire cantrip from a wizard, on the other hand, would do a d10 of damage. And as usual, weapons and spells are recorded on your character sheet. And we get to rule number four, five? Five. Uh, that damage doesn't matter until your character actually reaches uh, zero hit points. This, this isn't entirely true. Mm -hmm. Of course damage matters. It does get you closer and closer to zero hit points, mm -hmm. right? 
after which you are unconscious. Mm -hmm. But rules-wise, being wounded doesn't impair your character in any way. The same is true of monsters. Spreading mm -hmm. damage around between lots of different opponents is generally not as impactful as knocking mm -hmm. one unconscious so that they can't do anything, mm -hmm. right? And this is another kind of the, the keep the game moving, no penalties, only bonuses situation. And that wounded states, while they might be interesting, are interesting, you then have to track them, check what effects they are, how they slow down characters. And that's for a questionable game in, gain in fun. And this is better seen in computer games and other things that auto track bonuses and penalties for you. And finally, rolls of a natural 20 are a critical hit. And on a crit, you get to damage all your damage dice. So if you're attacking with a longsword that does a d8, you instead roll 2d8. That wizard's bolt of fire would do 2d10 instead of 1d10. Right, so doubling your dice is awesome, although bonuses like your strength modifiers, for example, are not doubled with a critical hit, only the dice. All damage dice really means all damage dice. So sneak attack, fury of the small, your paladin's divine smite, et cetera, et cetera. If you're rolling dice to do damage, you get to double all of them if you got a natural 20 when you hit, right? Speaking of natural 20s, um, we're gonna wrap up here with dying. <laughs> That's kind of morbid. Uh, so characters reduced to zero hit points or below are knocked unconscious and are in the process of dying. Dying characters get to play the Death Saves minigame, everybody's favorite yeah. minigame, <laughs> which, which, which is actually the, the fifth, I guess, of our uh, four D20 rolls of D&D. And Death Saves are what are uh, in game design called a race condition minigame, which is you're racing to see which of things happen first, whichever crosses the finish line. And in this case, at the beginning of the turn, an unconscious character rolls a D20. On a 10 plus, it's a success and a nine below a failure. So 55% chance of success. And next turn you get to roll again. And the three, you, three cumulative successes stabilize your character. They're not gonna die. Three cumulative failures and your character's dead. They succumb to their wounds and die. If you roll a natural 20, you wake up with one hit point. That's like your critical success on a death save, right? Mm -hmm. and, and since you do that at the beginning of your turn, you still get to take all of your actions and do everything that you could have done on mm -hmm. your turn were you not in the process of dying. So uh, it's awesome. Friends can, can stabilize unconscious mm -hmm. characters with magical healing or with a medicine skill check. Mm -hmm. um, remember, too, that you can make a medicine skill check even if you're not proficient. You just mm -hmm. don't get to add your proficiency mm -hmm. bonus. And the Death Save minigames is actually pretty great for a variety of reasons. First, from a design perspective, it gives unconscious characters a bit of control over their fate by letting them roll the die. And it also ensures the player gets one dice roll every turn, even if they're unconscious, mm -hmm. which is just good gameplay. Yeah. Second is the built-in drama. Death saves are mm -hmm. high stakes rolls, right? Mm -hmm. Third, dying takes a variable amount of time between three to five rounds. So uncertainty mm -hmm. also adds to the drama. Yeah. And, and then fourth, yeah. oh sorry, that's you. Yeah, well, fourth, you know, <laughs> party members, you have to weigh your options. That um, you do a lot of, players get to do a lot of actions during their fight, and the question is, do I give up my action to go stabilize my friend, or can they wait that one more turn where, you know, whatever knocked them unconscious is dealt with, and again, this is just good drama. It adds to the stakes, it's fun. Finally, natural 20s are amazing. There are a few things as satisfying as a natural 20 in this situation. Mm -hmm. Your character recovering consciousness and staggering up mm -hmm. to rejoin the fight. Some of you, we're, we're almost out of time, but we're also almost done, so I'll tell this really quick. Some of you may have seen, I did a collaboration mm -hmm. one-shot video with um, the Dungeon Dudes and the Triant Monk's Temple uh, a couple of months ago, and I forgot this rule, that if you roll a natural 20 on a death saving throw, you like wake up with one hit point, mm -hmm. and I, I rolled a natural 20 on my death save. And I was like, oh, what a waste of a natural 20. <laughs> and, and everybody laughed at me. They're like, that's like the best time you can possibly do that because then you, and not only that, but I did bounce up and then dealt like the killing blow to the storm giant that we were fighting. And it was, it was amazing. And it was so much fun. So anyway. And again, that's just, you know, that's where the designer is building drama into the game based on the rules that helps us, you know, all have a good time as we're playing. And a really kind of interesting thought about how people put this together to make a system that reinforces certain kinds of behaviors. And again, that's just kind of the mark of good design. But um, hey, thanks for showing up. I hope you guys all get a chance to maybe go down and play some D&D. &D. One final time, I'm Jeffrey Zatkin. Colby Polson.
Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Mm. Hope you guys have a great PAX. Mm. And um, stick around afterwards if you'd like to ask some questions. We'll, We're probably just about out of time. We'll, we'll just be out in the hall. Mm. How about but, by the windows? Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>